Well, hello, I'm Nurse Mo, and this is the Straight A Nursing Podcast, where I teach nursing concepts and share tips on how to thrive in school and at the bedside. So today I have a very special kind of big episode for you. It's it's basically a two-part episode. So in this first part, I'm joined by Tammy Hess from ATI, who's going to share with us some great tips on what happens if you don't get the score you need and kind of how to bounce back from that. And then I also have Kelly McCullough from Rasmussen University, who's also sharing some tips for nursing student success, getting into your program, and succeeding even if you have to retake the TEAS exam. So we'll listen in on that conversation, and then I'm going to come back and share with you five tips if you don't quite meet your T's score goal the first time. So five tips on what you can do to really turn that around and still meet your goal of getting into nursing school. So let's dive in first to this interview. Here you go. Okay, so I am here with two very special guests today. I have Tammy Hess from ATI and Kelly McCullough from Rasmussen University. So Tammy, why don't you real quick tell us a little bit about your role at ATI and then I'll have Kelly, I'll have you do the same. Okay, Um, my name is Tammy Hess and I have been with ATI almost 14 years, so uh, quite a while. And my role with ATI is um, admissions. So I have been focused on admissions t- since 2016, and that involves our TEAS test, our TEAS prep, anything that an incoming student um, that ATI touches. So you're the TEAS expert, basically. TEAS expert, yes. Okay, very yes. good. All right. How about you, Kelly? Hi, Warren. Thank you for having me today. So I am from Rasmussen University, and I am their Dean of Quality and Effectiveness. I've had an opportunity to work at the campus level as a Dean of Nursing and then work regionally with all of our nursing programs. And currently in my role of Dean of Quality and Effectiveness, work on a lot of initiatives to improve access for resources for student success and um, hopefully remove barriers for for their uh, success throughout their educational journey. That sounds lovely. I was just thinking, I don't believe my school had a dean of quality and effectiveness. Is that a unique role to Rasmussen? It is unique to Rasmussen. We transitioned to this role at the end of 2022 and uh, very excited. It was um, part of a new Center for Nursing Excellence initiative that the university has had. So we're really focused on a variety of support for students in the School of Nursing that will help them maintain on-time graduation rates, give them incredible resources to prepare for NCLEX success, first-time pass rates, and really help them through their educational journey. I love that. I love that students are actively being supported at your university. That's great. I feel like a lot of students struggle throughout school and, and maybe feel like they're not getting that support. I just think it's great that you guys go out of your way to do that for students. Okay, so the first question I have, and this is kind of for both of you, so you both can chime in. This is a question that I see pop up a lot amongst students, especially when they're feeling overwhelmed with the whole application process, which, as you both know, is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit intense. Why why the TEAS exam? Why is this so vitally important? So maybe Tammy, maybe you've got some things to say. And then Kelly, I'll, I've, I know you've got a really great perspective on this as well. Okay. Yeah. And just historically, TEAS was one of our first exams at ATI. So back in the late te- uh, late 1990s, TEAS was developed. And it was developed by a nurse who saw the need to help schools with um, admissions, to picking the right students. So So this is a predictive exam that helps our schools determine who is going to be successful in nursing school. And schools generally have a cut score. And and this is based on lots and lots of data um, that will help schools determine, okay, these are the students we need to take a look at. So just a quick historical background on the T's. Nice. Okay. I would say that when we look at 
uh, a student who wants to come into a school of nursing. We are looking for a qualified enrollment process. And the T's provide some visibility on a student's academic preparedness in reading English skills, math and science skills, which are very important for their success Mm -hmm. through their nursing coursework. Uh, You know, as as you can imagine, science is foundational. Um, It is so critical for them to have strong background in anatomy and physiology as they progress through the nursing program. English and uh, reading skills are very, very important for communication, effective communication. And when we look at math skills, that is that is a critical safety competency. As nurses are always doing dosage calculation at the bedside, yes. um, being required to look at intake and output that their clients uh, are experiencing. And so having having math safe math skills is very important. So it's been a it the tease itself provides some visibility on those basic skills that students need to come into the program with. Another thing that like as you're <clears throat> excuse me, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about what I hear from students, you know, I kind of say I have a Facebook group with about 16,000 students in it. And a lot of the time I just kind of sit back and listen and see what they're talking about. And sometimes, you know, the consensus is, you know, they're just trying to weed out the week with these types of exams. What do you have to say about that? Because I I always pop in and, and, and give my perspective. But when we talked, you know, we were talking earlier, I really loved what you had to say about this. Oh, I thank you. You know, I don't believe that nursing school is a process of weed out. Thank I, you. I think Thank you nursing, for saying that. <laughs> it is not. Yeah. It is not a process of weed out. I, I think nursing school is a process of building the professional identity and and the safety and competence that you need in the real world practice of professional nursing, which Love is it. incredibly difficult. As you know, you're, you know, practicing at the bedside. And so it is not an easy profession. Rewarding? Amazing. This is my 30th year as a registered nurse. Uh, and it is, I would never change it for anything. It's the most wonderful profession in the world. But you are entering um, a field where the decision that you make has serious consequences associated with it. And that is part of the journey of nursing school. It's it's mm-hmm. building your professional identity, your character, and giving the you the skills to, at the end, be a safe and competent nurse. So I don't see it as a weed out. I see it as, you know, I see it as a a series of assessments, which is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. As you know, students have many, many assessments throughout nursing school, many exams as they progress through the program. And their license in the end is determined upon one assessment, one One test, the national licensure (laughs) exam. Yeah, And this is one of the few degrees that if you don't pass an external licensure exam, you have no opportunity in the profession. Right. So there's no role for nursing without a license. And so, you know, I think learning the skills you need, being using the resources that you have access to um, is is very important because the tease is just the first small step and small the hurdle. First of many. Um, for what yeah. everything that comes many. afterwards. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. I always yeah. tell students that they are when you go to nursing school, you're you're undergoing the most massive transformation, one of the most massive transformations you'll make as a human being. And once you go through that, you'll never think like a normal person ever again. <laughs> like you are a totally different person by the end of that. That is so true. You know, Maureen, when I was in my doctorate program at orientation, uh, one of the professors stood up in front of the group of about about a hundred of us and said, every course you take, if you do not feel a transformation, you did not do work as a student. Wow. I like it. And it's true because anything that you choose to learn, whether you like it or not, should transform you. Right. And sometimes that is a little uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. 
very there. Yeah. And, and nursing school is uncomfortable. It is overwhelming. And, um, but it is filled with so many wonderful, supportive resources and individuals uh, to help you get to your goal. Let's talk a little bit about the TEAS exam. You mentioned there being a cutoff score. I guess, Tammy, this first part is for you. So let's say I'm a student. I just took my TEAS exam. I did score where I needed to. What happens next? Okay, I, I would say the first thing is, is that when they take the, the TEAS exam and they don't get the score, they will get a score report. And at the end of that score report, at the bottom of it is a section called topics to review. And so that will tell the student specifically what areas they need to focus on in order to improve their score. So, so that is linked directly to our study manual if they, if they choose to use that. But that will give them topic areas. And then they need to make, if they plan to take the T's again, they should make a study plan off of that score report over those topics to review to then take the T's again. That's, that's really important. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that would be the first step. And then the next step is, you know, taking the time, preparing and, and going at it again. And, and, you know, one of the things that I see students making a mistake at is not giving time to take the T's and have time to take it again. Don't just say, I'm going to cram this all in in a week and try and get this done and take it again. Take your time and prepare and take the T's. And, and hopefully, you know, you know, we're talking to this audience that have already taken it. You know, our goal is that you take it one time. So, yes. so kind of coming back to preparing, you know, taking, you know, understanding your deadlines, understanding, you know, when you need to study and how much you need to study and what, where your deficits are, and then going in and, and being successful in the T's. And then how much time you said, don't cram it in in a week, what yeah. would be maybe like an optimal time frame? I imagine it, it could vary depending on how much review needs to be done. Right. But is there like a general guideline for how much time? First time test takers, we say plan on about six weeks. Second attempt, and it depends on how much they need to study. Mm-hmm. I would say give it at least two to three weeks if they could. Okay. So and then, that, of course, you have be, your school deadline to yes. contend with as well. Yes. And some schools do do tell you how much time they require in between testing. So, you know, a lot oh, okay. of schools are at the three week mark. So, so we would prefer to to see it about that level. Okay. You know, I know with T's at ATI, it is fourteen days. Okay, that's the minimum fourteen days mm-hmm. in between. Yes. Okay, very good. Um, Kelly, any tips from you if a student didn't do so great with their first attempt and they're they're coming back and they're going to take it again because they really want to get into Rasmussen University and meet that criteria? Well, I I have to say, Tammy, I can't agree with you more with the importance of preparing first for the initial attempt. And I I did want to add that there are a lot of resources that students could use to measure their predictive um, ability on the assessment. So consider doing a practice test before you actually take the assessment. So you get a gauge of where your, where your strengths and your opportunities are. However, if you were unsuccessful, it's not the end. It just gives you opportunity and visibility on where you do have some deficits, uh, information now to really dig into and to learn. And I would strongly encourage you to try again. Again, take the time you need to be very intentional and very thoughtful in your remediation process and, and then come back and try. I, I also equate it to the profession of nursing, how difficult the profession of nursing can be in many, many ways, how, how really, again, hard you're going to work, how wonderful the rewards are, but it does take a lot of grit to do that. And if you're not willing to put the work in on the front end, then it's going to be hard to, I really believe, reap the rewards on the back end because right. you are going to have to work very hard not only throughout the program, but even as you continue in the profession, because the profession is one of lifelong learning. So you're always going to be um, assessed and and most often on some exams as you continue through your journey as as a registered nurse. How many students, I mean, maybe not how many students, but I think a lot of times students feel like they are alone in this you know, not passing or not getting the score they need for the T's exam. But I I would imagine a lot of students 
take it more than once. Am I correct in that? Yeah, we see about 30% of students have to take it more than once. Okay, so that's a fair amount. That's uh-huh. that's a fair amount. Mm-hmm. And I would say in my experience, Maureen, that that may be a higher number um, for students who are coming to Rasmussen University. You know, I find that our students often um, have been out of school for a very long time or uh, just were not focused um, initially mm-hmm. on their mm-hmm. academics and and were life interfered in some way and they weren't able to to have continuous progression. So I would say in my experience, I would say that the number of students who need to retake it, that's that's a little bit higher. Mm-hmm. But again, I think it's 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 just your journey. And right. you know, take time to mm-hmm. build this foundational knowledge because it you will be using all of these skills throughout your education yes. and certainly throughout your role as a professional nurse. So there are no shortcuts to math science. <laughs> right. <laughs> Reading and English skills. Yeah. <laughs> And the path is never as straight as you initially hope that it's going yes. to be. So, <laughs> yeah. And you're so, hoping for students to jump in and be ready to go. So, so preparing for the yeah. tease is not a waste of time, too. So a lot of people are like, why do I have to do this? Right. It, it will help you. It will help you be ready to go and, and ready to start your your nursing journey. Yes. Yeah. And you got to be ready because once it mm-hmm. once it <laughs> once the hit that go button, it is it's full press the whole time. Right. Okay, great. So what would you say? Okay, so kind of looking beyond the T's, which is a really key part of nursing admissions at many, many uh, colleges and universities. I'm curious what you would say, Kelly, as to what other things would make a student really stand out as a potential candidate. I think when students are looking to stand out to gain one of the nursing seats, They need to make sure that they are as prepared as they possibly can be. And what I mean by that is, first off, do not procrastinate. If you have, if you have a list of admission criteria, take your time, go through that list methodically, get the documents that are required, transcripts, immunizations, perhaps some health screenings, and um, make sure they're completed that you're following the directions, you're completing them as you need to and submit them in a timely fashion. I think that's very, very important. I also think if you have an opportunity as a student to engage in any type of interview or essay process, it's very important to look at perhaps what transferable skills you may have. So if you're not currently working in healthcare, but you may be working in customer service, or perhaps you served one summer as a lifeguard or camp counselor, I think there are so many transferable skills that you can share um, that that do give you an advantage as you progress through the program. It could be in, in your flexibility. It could be in your... Um, reaction to feedback. It could be in your customer service. So I think those are those are things that you should highlight if you've participated in any volunteer experiences. Incredibly valuable to share um, with your team who is assessing the admission criteria. I would add to that, I think another quality that maybe students don't realize is super transferable is problem solving ability. Absolutely. I feel mm-hmm. like that's all I do at work is look for problems and figure out ways to fix them or mitigate them or avoid them altogether. So yeah, even if you don't have healthcare experience, there's so much maybe from a prior career, prior job that actually does translate over because nursing is so, so diverse that it, it pulls from so many disciplines. Absolutely. And there's such value as well, Maureen. I, wanted, I, I just want to acknowledge stay-at-home parents you know, how much they also have in their experience that they can translate to healthcare. Um, And so if if you if you're not working in field or or you're not working outside the home, there's still many examples I'm sure that you can think of to share. um, Yeah. Just because it's at home doesn't mean it's not work. (laughs) Absolutely not. (laughs) And you are problem solving for your family all day long. All the time. So a moment ago, you mentioned if the student has an opportunity to maybe write an essay or a statement of purpose. And students, I find, often struggle. They're not sure what to to put in there. What would be some things that would be that you would look for as someone evaluating a statement of purpose or an entrance essay? I'm really looking 
for the genuine characteristics or, or, or the genuine feeling someone has to enter the nursing profession. So when I hear someone share with me, I'm coming into the nursing profession because I'm going to make good money, I think to myself, it might be hard to last in the nursing profession. Yeah. Because although the money may be good, it is not an easy job. Um, it's it's a very it's it's very emotional. And um again, I, I never discount how rewarding it is. Like I had mentioned, 30 years in the profession, I love it. But um I don't think that you can be driven by the dollars to sustain right. in in the nursing profession. Mm-hmm. So I'm really looking in, you know, what is important to you? Why do you want to make a difference? And I do hear, you know, I want, I want to make a difference in someone's life. How? Um, what does that look like and feel like to you? And where do you see yourself? Now, many of us, maybe where we thought we would be, that may not be where we end up in the nursing profession as you continue your journey through, mm-hmm. through school, but that you have, um, that you have some vision. For where you'd want to be. And I would also say goals. You know, where are your goals? Where are your goals? How are your goals to finish nursing school? And then perhaps what is your next one, two, three year goal for where you see yourself? I think those are very important to talk about. I also, you mentioned problem solving. I think you need to express how you problem solve if you have the opportunity. And mm-hmm. I also would like to see how receptive you are to feedback. Because oh, yeah, that's a big one. The work that we do is incredibly collaborative and um, you must be receptive to feedback from your patient, from your clients, from your coworkers, from, from your, your supervisors, professor. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah. along the yeah. way. And, yeah. and I think that, I think that says a lot about someone's character. You know, we are the most trusted profession. We're the most trusted profession because of the integrity and the ethical fabric that we have. And right. so... I think that's important to talk about when you're looking to enter a nursing school, how you uphold your ethical character, how you uphold yes. your integrity. I love that. Yes. Um, yeah. Speaking of feedback, I know it's often a little bit of a shocker to students as they enter nursing school to realize they are going to be evaluated on I would say a daily basis, even multiple times a day with all the assessments and um, clinical observation and skills observations, and it can be a little bit overwhelming for them. And so I always tell them, you know, accepting feedback with grace is really, really important. You you can't let yourself get defensive. You can't take it personally. Mm -hmm. You have to look at it as this person who's giving you feedback is doing you a huge favor by telling you exactly, exactly what you can do to be even better. So looking at it as opportunity and, and taking your your ego and your sense of um, self-worth completely out of it because you're not always going to get the feedback that you want, especially when you're new and you're, you're learning. There's a lot, there's a huge learning curve with nursing school. Okay, let's talk a little bit about why... And Kelly, we had talked earlier and, and you had some really great things to say about why nursing school is so challenging. I think you mentioned that it is the most demanding undergraduate degree. And and so why is that? Somebody who I did might say just, that. Yeah, you did. So, you know, somebody who doesn't really understand what nurses do might think, why? I, I'm just I just want to go care for people and be kind to them and and make them happy and comfortable. But it's nursing, by the way, the job is like <laughs> way more than that. But why yeah. is the the schooling and like entrance exams and the whole thing? Why is this so, so rigorous? Yes, absolutely. Well, the nursing profession is governed by your regulatory bodies in the in each state. And um, they are their main job is to protect the safety of the community. So the nursing graduate takes a national licensure exam to demonstrate safety and competence. The university or college, the nursing school, the same way is held accountable to those standards that they're producing safe graduate nurses. So the stakes are high, just the stakes are high for the program and the stakes are high for the students. And we want and expect students to succeed on first attempt. So that's very important to have a culture of success first time around. When I sit back and I think about the work that we do, we are dealing with clients in the most vulnerable times of their life. 
the most vulnerable times that whether they're they're entering the world through birth, a mom who's delivering brand new baby, whether um, they're preparing for a new diagnosis or a surgical procedure, how overwhelming that is for the family, and and certainly certainly death. And and what an honor to be to be a nurse in that environment and and to work with families at end of life. But no matter what you're doing, you're dealing with the most with with individuals in their most vulnerable times. And like we like we talked about earlier, every decision you make has significant consequence associated with it. So an error in medication administration could result in harm. An error in assessment could result in harm. An error in um in safety, for example, even just even just rotating the patient in bed and failure to do that results in harm. And so everything we do has such significant risk associated with it um, to the client or to the community that it is critical that we're we're monitoring and um, and producing safe and competent nurses. Nice. And and the schools are so invested in that because again, I don't think students realize how important it is for the school to have the outcomes related yes. to um, national licensure success, related to program completion, related to job placement, um, mm-hmm. because they are evaluated on all of those criteria, not only from boards of nursing, but also accreditation agencies as well. Yes, very important. I always instruct students when you're you're looking at colleges, look at their NCLEX pass rates, look at their license, their you know accreditations, all of those things. That's really really important. Mm-hmm. So, I want I want Kelly. I want you to take just a quick minute because I learned some cool things about Rasmussen as we were preparing for this for this discussion. So, can you give us a quick like highlight of why it's such an excellent school of learning for nursing? Thank you. I, well, I have been at Rasmus in 13 years now, and it's a wonderful environment for someone to come to nursing school, one for all the phenomenal resources that we have for the student. Uh, lots of support from the time they enter until, well, as they continue their journey and are working in practice. So uh, that's fantastic. We also have laddered curriculum. So many of our students start at a LPN pro practical nurse program. And now we have programs all the way through the doctoral um, range. So first licensure at the associate degree level and first licensure at the baccalaureate level. We're very fortunate to offer advanced practice, education and leadership tracks as a master's degree. And what I find what students like most is our flexibility in enrollment cycles. So Mm -hmm. students have an opportunity to start at least four times a year and graduate four times a year. So we are a university that doesn't hold you up should you have something that interferes because we offer our courses every quarter, four times through the year. So, you know, if someone stumbles and, um, you know, perhaps misses that maternal child course, they don't have to wait a year to get back into it and then move forward. Yeah, a lot of students. That's a huge delay. Yes. So you're able to jump right back in um, the following quarter and and use the resources you need to be successful. So I think really those are the things that are standout for us. Um, And just I I can't say enough about the phenomenal faculty team that I have the opportunity to work with and the university leadership that's that's committed to student success. Nice. Sound. Yeah, I was going to say it really sounds like you you want your students to succeed. We do. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tammy, anything about ATI you want to add in before we close out and ATI's commitment to student success? But yes, and we we also would like to see students succeed. So beyond just the T's, uh, ATI will be with most students even through their nursing career. So we are looking to help students. They won't like us at first, not until they get to the end, (laughs) but we... We do a lot of testing, we do a lot of remediation, and we test again. So so we want to make sure that you are prepared 
to prepared for nursing school, prepared to take the NCLEX, you know, through all the phases of your nursing career, we, we are there to help and we have the resources available. So we, um, we have been dedicated to, um, to nursing, you know, for as long as I've been here and it just continues to grow. And I'm excited about the resources that we have for students and, and we, we are there to help. And where can students find you on the web? Um, at uh, ATITesting.com. Okay. So, yes. ATITesting.com. And then Kelly Rasmussen uh-huh. is is that. What's Rasmussen.edu. Your... And I'll put all of this in the episode notes because I realize people are driving or walking their dogs or things right now. Okay. I want to thank both of you very, very much. I think this was great. I think this will segue beautifully into the remainder of this episode, which is all about what happens when you take the T's, but you don't quite meet your goal. We really want students to go for that second attempt and follow their dreams. So thank you both very, very much. I always think it's so helpful to hear from people that work in admissions or work at a university, and they really can tell you what types of things will help set you up for success. So that was really great to hear that from Kelly. And then Tammy at ATI is always just a wonderful source of information as well. So before we dive into my five tips for when you don't meet your T's score goal, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back for that. Are you ready for the T's exam? Use promo code SAN. 15 to get 15% off official T's prep by ATI, including ATI T's smart prep and the official ATI T's online practice tests. The ATI T's smart prep tutorial has proven results to raise your score by more than 7.5%. Don't just prep to pass, prep to get your highest score possible with ATI. Visit www.atitesting.com forward slash T's dash prep for more information. That's atitesting.com forward slash T's dash prep for more information. And that code is SAN15, S-A-N-1-5. So the process of applying to nursing school really does place students under a lot of intense scrutiny. And there's a lot of pressure to perform at these really high levels. And and I'm not just talking about the grades you need in your prerequisite classes, but you also need to score adequately on your entrance exam. And in a lot of cases, that entrance exam is the ATI T's exam. And a lot of schools will use this as a benchmark, as a cutoff. And if you don't score at their level, then you're not even going to be considered. You're not even in the running for a seat in that program. So it's a really, really important exam. And when you don't meet that criteria, it can lead to a lot of uncomfortable feelings, feelings of discouragement. And for some students, you might even think of giving up on your dream. And I definitely don't want you to do that. So if this describes you or you're worried about it happening to you, then I want you to know you're not alone. And I 100% believe that you can achieve your goals. So so in this episode, I'm going to be sharing five tips for moving past this temporary obstacle so you can get the score you need and apply to your dream nursing school program with confidence. So tip number one is to shift your mindset Now, nursing students, in my experience, are really high achievers. So there's a tendency to take each and every shortcoming as this personal failure. And I want you to know that could not be further from the truth. The reality of it is nursing school and that whole process of getting into nursing school is challenging. And many, many very talented students don't hit their goals the first time around. You heard when we went through that conversation with Tammy and Kelly that it's 30% or even 40% of students who don't meet their T-score goal the first time around and have to retake that exam. So a lot of students move past this, and I really hope you can too. Absolutely in no way does it make you a 
failure. Okay. So if you don't meet that goal, you're not a failure. In fact, I like to think of the word fail as an acronym, meaning first attempt in learning. So a key to bouncing back from this first attempt is to shift your mindset from one of failure to one of opportunity. And a key way to do that is to change how you talk to yourself. So here's a little story about how powerful that can be. A few years ago, I taught a student how to reframe her negative self talk. And the results were just absolutely incredible. This particular student had a lot of math anxiety and constantly said negative things to herself like, I am bad at math. That was kind of her go-to statement whenever she was approached with or looking at a math problem. So after learning some reframing tips that I shared with her, she changed that statement from I am bad at math to I am open to learning how to do math. I know this is hard, but I'm practicing and getting better every day. And with this reframed way of talking to herself, she completely shifted her mindset around math. She started practicing more, and she ultimately passed her dosage calculations exams with confidence. So you can apply the same principles to your situation, especially if you're letting a lot of negative self-talk really dominate your mindset. The key with shifting how you speak to yourself is to replace that negative statement with something that's true and attainable. So for example, the student I mentioned a moment ago didn't suddenly start saying, I'm great at math because she wouldn't have believed that. Instead, she created a true and attainable statement. So if you're saying things like, I'm a failure, I'll never get into nursing school, things like that, how can you reframe that statement? So If you want to pause here and think about it and jot some things down, if you're not driving, perfect. Here are some ideas to get you started. So a reframed statement might be something like, I may have scored low on this one exam, but I am dedicated to working hard to achieve the score I need. Or how about this one? Many students retake the TEAS exam. What I'm experiencing is not unusual. Or this one, I am studying daily and will go into my next attempt with confidence. So as you can see, these aren't things that wouldn't necessarily feel true to you. And that is the key. So take a moment, think about how you could reframe whatever your negative self-talk statement is into something that is true and attainable. I think you'll be really surprised at how well this simple tip works. All right. Tip number two is to create a study plan. So one of the great things about ATI that you heard Tammy speak to is that they truly do want students to succeed. And that's why they provide detailed feedback after your exam. So you know exactly how to focus your studying. So again, just to reiterate what Tammy shared, when you receive your score report from ATI, it's going to include a section titled Topics to Review. This focused review is directly linked to subject areas within the ATIT's study manual. So they make it really easy for you to just go back and review those key things that are going to need a little extra attention from you. And if you're not utilizing the ATI prep materials for the exam, or you maybe didn't the first time around, I highly, highly recommend that you do so. So two key resources from ATI are that study manual. It's called the ATIT's study manual, and they have something called Smart Prep Tutorial. So this focused review after the exam, again, is directly linked to the study manual, and that Smart Prep Tutorial provides a comprehensive and organized way to prepare for the TEAS exam. I will put a link to ATI in the episode notes, but if you can remember it, it's atitesting.com. And then 
If you need another reason to invest in these resources, some research shows that the average second attempt score can be increased by 7.5% when using that smart prep tutorial. So in other words, basically drop what you're doing right now, go get both of these resources. You can even save 15% on that smart prep tutorial when you use the promo code SAN15, S-A-N-1-5. Now there is a time limit on that promo code So I would suggest that you go sooner rather than later to redeem that. I don't have the exact date. I believe it's valid until May or through the month of May. But just to be certain, go and check that out as soon as you can. Now, once you've obtained your focused review from ATI, work those study sessions into your schedule over the next few weeks. Tammy suggested at least two weeks to review. Don't try to cram it in in a few days. Make sure your expectations with this are realistic. Make sure you're giving yourself enough time to review each key area. Do all of that before you take your next exam and get those dates and those study sessions in your planner. You know how much I believe in planning. This is definitely something you want to plan for. All right, before we dive into tip number three, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about switching up how you study. Get the support you need from a national leader in nursing education, Rasmussen University. You can begin sooner with multiple start dates per year and no waiting list at many campuses for qualified applicants. Learn more at rasmussen.edu forward slash nursing. All right, so we're back for tip number three, and I cannot emphasize enough how much sometimes the opportunity to overcome an obstacle comes out of just simply changing how you study. So take a moment, think objectively about how you felt as you were studying for the T's exam. Did you feel confident as you reviewed the material? Or did you kind of always feel like the concepts weren't easily understood? And then think about the process you used to study and see if you can identify opportunities to make your studying more engaging. So here are a few ideas. Instead of reading passively, which is not very effective for a lot of people, I want you to take notes as you go. And if you're not sure how to do this or where to start, a great way to do this is by using the Cornell method. So this method was developed by a Cornell professor, and it provides a really organized framework for taking notes and reviewing them later. I'll put a link in the episode notes that explains the Cornell method in more detail. Essentially, you're going to take your paper, You're going to draw a line down kind of not quite the middle, but towards the left side of the page. And then in some cases, you also want to designate a space along the bottom. The space along the bottom is used if you're going to write a summary of the ideas presented in that page of notes. And that's really helpful. And then on that main part of the page, you have a left little column, and then a right side larger column because you drew that line. And on the left side is where you'll put some key words. And then on the right side is where you will explain those keywords. On the left side, it could even be questions. What is homeostasis? And then you answer that in that larger right column. And then you can easily go back through your notes, cover up that right side, which is basically the answer, and go down that left side and quiz yourself on the subjects and the topics that are in your notes. So again, I'll put a link that will explain that a lot better than I did. So make sure that you check that out. Now, if you're more of an auditory learner, Record yourself reading through your notes and record yourself explaining key concepts. And then you can play these recordings back as you drive, as you go for walks, or just even do chores around the house. And if you get a lot out of talking things through, a great idea is to meet up with another student and quiz each other using those ATIT's prep 
materials as a guide. And if you don't know anyone else applying to nursing school, guess what? There's a ton of people applying to nursing school. You just got to find them, right? So join a Facebook group or maybe a, a Reddit subreddit or whatever that's called. You can tell I don't use Reddit that often, but join a group, find a community, find those people and offer to meet over Google Meet or over Zoom and do your quizzing with each other that way. And if you're having a hard time remembering key facts, then make flashcards and sift through them when you have some unexpected downtime, like pull them out when you're waiting in a long line at the grocery store or while you're stuck in traffic, but only if you're not driving. Okay, let's move on to tip number four. And this one is about conquering test anxiety. So even the most prepared student can suffer from test anxiety, and this can drastically affect your performance. I want you to know that the first thing to understand about test anxiety is that a little bit is actually a good thing. It heightens our awareness and it makes us more diligent and more careful. But when there's too much anxiety, it's going to impede thought processing and problem solving abilities. The signs and symptoms of test anxiety can manifest in all kinds of ways. It can be behaviorally, physically, and emotionally. So some behavioral signs might be fidgeting. So if you notice yourself fidgeting, that's a sign that you're getting some anxiety going. Pacing, maybe clicking your pen over and over again. Some physical symptoms could be tremors or shakiness, a rapid pulse. Maybe you feel nauseous, you have an upset stomach, you may even have diarrhea. You might have a dry mouth, be sweating. All of those things are physical symptoms of anxiety. And then emotional symptoms can include depression and feelings of hopelessness or inadequacy. So the first weapon in your arsenal against test anxiety is to understand why it's happening. In fact, there are a lot of reasons why you would be anxious about your ATIT's exam, and all of them are valid. Sometimes just knowing that it's normal to feel a certain way makes managing those feelings a lot easier. So let's look at what are some reasons why you might feel anxious about your ATIT's exam. So first of all, Yes, it is a high stakes exam. And if you've scored below your goal in the past, feeling anxious heading into your second or your third attempt is completely normal. The key is to keep your anxiety at that manageable level. So here are a few tips. Every time you sit down to study for your T's exam, I want you to start your study session by taking five deep and calming breaths. So this simple habit will start to train your brain and your body to associate the T's exam with this calming activity. And then when you sit down to take the actual exam, take five deep breaths before you begin. You've already conditioned yourself to use deep breathing as a calming exercise. So it will definitely help reduce anxiety when it's time for you to take your exam. And then as you take your exam, be aware of your thoughts. The moment your thoughts start to head down that pathway of that negative self-talk, there's a huge risk they could spiral out of control. Instead, make a conscious effort to bring your focus back to reality. And a quick way to do this is with the 54321 grounding technique. And depending on the testing environment, it might be a little bit challenging to utilize the final two steps, and we'll get to those in just a moment. But even just doing a partial grounding technique can work wonders for easing anxiety. I do this on airplanes when it starts to get bumpy, and I'm telling you, it works. So here's how we do the 54321 grounding technique. First, Acknowledge five things that you can see around you. So this might be the keyboard, the desk, the chair, a window, a door. You're just pulling yourself back into reality. Next, acknowledge four things you can feel around you. Maybe it's the chair under your legs, your pen in your hands, your hair touching your neck, the computer mouse, the edge of your shirt touching your wrist. So four things you can feel. 
Then acknowledge three things you can hear. Maybe it's the air conditioner, the traffic outside the window, the creak of your chair as you shift your weight. And then the last two, again, depending on the testing environment, might be a little more difficult, but you want to try to acknowledge two things you can smell. Maybe you can smell the scented lotion that you wore today or coffee that's brewing down the hall. And then the last one is to acknowledge one thing you can taste. Maybe it's the mint from your morning toothpaste. I I imagine you're probably not bringing food into the testing center. That one might be a little bit challenging. And then another tip is to release actual physical tension from your body. So an easy way to do this is place your feet flat on the floor, grab the underside of your chair with your hands, and then push down with your feet as you pull up with your hands. And this just kind of tenses up all your muscles. And then hold that for a count of five, release and relax for a count of 10. And then repeat that one, two, or three more times, depending on how tense your physical body feels. And then the last little tip for getting that test anxiety under control is to avoid watching the clock. Because the ATIT's exam is a timed exam, you may feel a compulsion to constantly be checking the clock and kind of doing that that test math, right? Well, I've got this many questions and only this much time and I'm not going to finish on time. And then you start spiraling, right? That can greatly increase your anxiety. If you must check the clock, make an agreement with yourself that you'll only check the clock after every 30 to 40 questions, for example. Now, another reason you may experience test anxiety with the TEAS exam is associating your performance on the exam with your sense of self-worth. Again, nursing students tend to be high-achieving individuals, and when you don't meet your goal with this important exam, it can be a significant blow to your self-esteem. The key with attacking this root cause of test anxiety is understanding you are not your grades, and your grades are not a reflection of you. And one more reason why you may have test anxiety is because you're actually afraid of disappointing others. After all, you have been working really hard towards your goal and expectations are high. Plus, if you're supporting a family or a spouse, they're counting on you and you definitely don't want to disappoint the people that you love. The truth is, nursing school is going to be full of exams that are just as high stakes or even more so as the T's. The key with attacking this cause of test anxiety is to put it into perspective. This type of exam is going to become routine when you're in nursing school. So think of it as one exam of many, not your entire future. And then my final tip Tip number five for bouncing back and going back to retake the T's exam is to remember your why. So in order to bounce back from a shortfall with the T's exam or any exam, you must remember your why. It's going to take hard work and dedication to continue studying for the T's exam and to walk back into that testing center with confidence. But I know you can do it. Before you let yourself even think about giving up on your dream, take a moment to reflect on why you want to pursue a career in nursing. I would love it if you would take some time, maybe after you listen to this podcast, or if you're in a place right now to sit down with a piece of paper and a pen, use these journaling prompts to help you get to the core of why you dream of being a nurse. So those are, what does being a nurse mean to me? What will I feel like when I see RN, LVN, or LPN after my name? What will my life be like when I'm working as a nurse? How will being a nurse fulfill me mentally, spiritually, and or emotionally? And what am I going to do to ensure I continue on this path. So I'll put all these journaling prompts in the episode notes so that you didn't feel like you had to remember what they are right now. But I really want you to take the time to go through this exercise. It can be very powerful. 
Now, while everyone's reasons for becoming a nurse are unique, some universal positive aspects of the career are that, one, there's a huge opportunity for a wide range of nursing roles and nursing career paths. If you're the type of person who likes to explore different career options, then nursing will open so many doors for you. And then another one is variety. After working as a registered nurse for over 11 years, I can honestly say that no two days are the same. It's one of my favorite aspects of my job. Another key benefit is job stability that comes with working in healthcare. I've never once visited a hospital website and seen zero jobs posted for nurses. In fact, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that registered nurse employment is expected to grow 6% from 2021 to 2031. There's also the impact of doing meaningful work, and this cannot be overstated. It's rewarding to know that at the end of the day, you've had a direct impact on someone else. So if living a purposeful life is important to you, this may be at the root of your why. And then for many nurses, the flexible schedule is a key benefit. As a nurse, you might work a regular eight to five schedule. You might work three 12 hour shifts a week. You might work per diem or you might work a few weeks at a time on a travel assignment. The flexibility allows many nurses to attend their kids activities, go on trips or explore outside passions and hobbies. And then another key benefit is being part of a dynamic team. If you enjoy working with others to achieve common goals, then nursing can be highly rewarding for you. When you work in an environment that fosters teamwork and fosters collaboration, going to work can almost feel like you're hanging out with your friends all day. And who doesn't want to do that? So before I go, I've got one more bonus tip for you, and that is just because you receive a no thank you letter from a school does not always mean it's game over. If you're on the borderline with your T-score or maybe some other criteria and you didn't get into your school of choice, keep in touch with the admissions department. Not all students who receive an acceptance letter will end up attending that program and additional spots may open up. So stay positive while you continue to review and study for your second attempt. So I hope these tips help you feel more empowered after experiencing a setback with your TEAS exam. I want to wish you the very best of luck. I'm over here cheering for you, and I totally believe that you can and will achieve your goals. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope that you take the time to subscribe to the podcast, share it with a friend, rate and review all of those things that help us reach more students. And when you subscribe to the podcast, all the episodes show up like magic for you in your favorite podcast player library. So I will see you again soon. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.